गुड डे एवरी वन एंड वेलकम टू एपिसोड फाइव ऑफ द महाभारता एज इज पॉडकास्ट दिस पॉडकास्ट एक्सप्लोर ईच एंड एवरी चैप्टर ऑफ द महाभारता टेक्स्ट विच इज द बिगेस्ट एपिक इन ह्यूमन हिस्ट्री इन दिस एपिसोड वी विल डिस्कस द फोर्थ सेक्शन ऑफ द एपिक दिस सेक्शन इज टाइटल पोलूम पार्वा एंड इज पार्ट ऑफ द लार्जर आदि पार्वा महाभारता टेक्स्ट इज डिवाइडेड इन टू मेन पार्वाज और वॉल्यूम्स एंड सब पार्वाज और सेक्शंस Each main parva has many sub parvas just as each volume of a book can have many sections. Please see episode description to understand the classification in more detail. Before we start today's episode I would like to once again thank my listeners for the feedback and questions. After carefully considering the feedback I am happy to announce that from now on the last segment of every episode will be fully dedicated to discussing your questions and feedback. and finally depending upon the platform where you are listening to this podcast please feel free to leave me a comment question or feedback alternatively you can drop me an email at mahabharata as is at outlook.com please like subscribe and share if you find this podcast useful so now we are in poloma parva recall from episode 4 that we were in a ceremony in which sage ugar sharva or sati has narrated the story of king janmeja and the circumstances that led to him organizing a large snake sacrifice now naturally one might think that this parva should go into the main mahabharata story itself or continue to describe the snake sacrifice but none of that happens in earlier parva sothi gives us a brief description of the actual mahabharata story but then digresses into snake sacrifice This time he digresses into an altogether different direction. Only this time he does not do it by choice. He is in fact asked to do so by his host, a learned sage who has organized the ceremony which Sothi is attending. The name of the sage is Sage Shonuka. This parva tells us that Shonuka is a learned man and knows the tradition, the Puranas, the Vedas and other key religious texts. Other sages request Sothi to wait until Sage Shonuka has completed his rituals and has joined the conversation. When Shonuka joins them, he greets Sothi and other sages. He praises Sothi and his father for their knowledge of ancient tales and remarks that given Sothi is a great storyteller and knows many stories from ancient times, he would like to hear the story of Bhigu lineage. And so it happens. Next we hear about the sage Bhigu and his lineage. Sage Bhigu had a son by the name of Chaivana. Chaivana gives birth to a son named Pramati. From Pramati or Pramati is born Ruru and Ruru's son is Shunka. So Shunka is the great grandfather of Shonuka. Now in case you are completely lost by now Shonuka is the person who is hearing this story from Sothi the host of the ceremony The Shunka and Shonuka are two similar sounding names so just to be clear Shunka is the great grandfather of Shonuka To remember Shonuka is the person organizing the ceremony and Shunka is his great grandfather Both are from the lineage of Bhigu so in other words Shonuka the host is hearing the story of his own ancestors from Sathi. Shonuka interrupts Sathi here. Why was Bhrigu's son called Chaivana? he asks. Sathi explains that this has got to do with the circumstances leading to Chaivana's birth. Bhrigu was married to a lady by the name of Poluma and by the way this is how this parva get gets its name. Poluma parva One day when Bhigu was out for his morning rituals Poluma his wife was inside the ashram resting perhaps because she was pregnant a demon by the name of Poluman shows up at her door seeing a guest she welcomes him and offers him some food and drink Poluman however the demon is swayed by her immense beauty he is taken over by lust Suddenly he realizes from many years ago that Poluma was in fact engaged to him. Yes, the lady was supposed to marry him, but for some reason which this parva does not explain, 
is married off to Bhrigu. It appears from reading the Parva that Puluman is a bit doubtful about his recollection. Despite recognizing the lady as Poluma, he still wants to confirm that this place is in fact Sage Bhrigu's ashram. Perhaps he is having a hard time recognizing the lady, maybe because so many years have passed. But this Parva does not tell us anything. What it tells us though is that Puluman wants to be 100% certain that this is Bhrigu's ashram and that lady is Bhrigu's wife. He wants to be sure before he takes any action. But who to ask? There is no one around. So he decides instead to ask Agni or the god of fire because Agni cannot lie. Agni has no choice but to reveal the fact to Puluman. This ashram is in fact Bhrigu's and the lady is his wife Puluma. Puluman is a demon and capable of assuming any form he likes. He assumes the form of a wild boa and abducts the pregnant Puluma. The hasty steps are very uncomfortable for the pregnant lady. Severely affected by the jolts of a running boa, the baby inside her womb falls. She gives birth and the child falls to the ground. This child is the son of a powerful sage Bhrigu. It is no ordinary child. He already enjoys extraordinary powers inherited from his father. As soon as he is born, he burns down the evil demon to ashes. One moment Puluman is dashing past, the next he mixes with five elements. The frail lady sits in middle of nowhere with her newly born son in her lap. She cries for help but is nowhere to be found. Her condition is so miserable that Lord Brahma descends from heaven to assist her. Consoled by the creator of the three worlds, she makes her way to the ashram. Her tears have almost filled a river that follows her. Lord Brahma names the river as Vasundra, and that would now flow besides Bhrigu's ashram. Bhrigu is now back in his ashram. He is enraged by his wife's condition. He shouts, Who told the demon that it was my ashram? It was Agni who revealed the details to Pluman, replies his wife, sobbing in pain. Bhrigu is enraged at Agni. He shouts a curse. From now on, Agni, you shall devour anything and everything. And as for the child, the name Chaivana is assigned, literally meaning the one who is deprived of. He was deprived of his mother's womb earlier than usual and thus the name. A sage son is born in Bhrigu's house. What a moment for the couple. But Agni is miserable. He has been cursed. Addressing Bhrigu, he makes an attempt to explain his position. By my very nature, O Bhrigu, I am bound to speak the truth. I did what I am made to do, speak the truth when I am asked. Since when speaking the truth has become a crime to warrant such a harsh punishment? Bhrigu, however, is only listening. Agni reminds Bhrigu as to why he cannot devour anything and everything. I am used in sacred Vedic rituals and it is in me that the offerings are made. Those offerings are passed on to gods and ancestors for them to maintain the order of the universe. In a way, I am the mouth of gods and ancestors. With this position, how can you curse me of being an omnivore? You in fact have cursed the whole universe, Bhrigu. Bhrigu is still listening, Agni continues. Listen carefully, O divine sage Bhrigu. I, the Agni, the god of fire, the flame of Vedas, and the creator, maintainer, and destroyer of the three worlds, hereby withdraw myself from every object of the universe. This was no good news. Agni is present in every particle of the universe, as heat, electricity, radiation, energy, etc. The withdrawal halts the whole order of the universe. Agni had no other choice either. If he turns into an omnivore, the universe will self-destruct. Hearing this terrible vow of Agni, the sages around the world rush to gods for help. Gods, as usual, rush to Lord Brahma for help. Brahma summons Agni and expresses his disapproval of the Agni's decision to withdraw itself. While aware of the Bhrigu's curse, he empathizes with Agni too. Withdrawal or not, his creation will be destroyed anyways. 
If Agni turns omnivore, the universe will self-destruct. If it withdraws, the universe dies a cold death. So he grants Agni two boons that will help soothe the curse. You will turn omnivore as per the curse of Sage Bhrigu, but only at the time when you are given the offerings as part of the sacred rites, and anything that is offered to you shall become pure. This was big, very big. First, it meant that Agni would devour anything and everything, but only when he is lit at the time of sacred Vedic rituals. And secondly, anything it burns will be rendered pure. Agni thus gains his purity, and so pacified releases his presence as before, permeating into every particle of the universe. Gods and sages are rejoiced and return to their lives. Prigu's son Chaivana gives birth to a resplendent sage Pramati. From Pramati is born Ruru. Ruru is married to a very beautiful girl by the name of Pramadwara. Pramadwara's story is also very interesting. She is the daughter of Menka, the divine maiden, and Vishwavasu, the king of Gandharvas. She was born outside of the wedlock. As soon as she is born, Menka leaves her at the river bank near the ashram of a sage by the name of Stulkesh. The sage adopts the poor girl and she grows up to become the most beautiful girl in the town. Ruru falls in love with her and both are engaged. Then one day, as the girl is playing with her mates in the ashram, she steps on a coiled snake, a very poisonous one. Pramadwara receives a fatal bite. In seconds, she turned blue and collapses on the ground. Life leaves her as if it never existed. The whole ashram panics. They encircle the dead girl. Ruru almost faints. A moment ago, he was watching his beloved cheering and now the god of death has stolen her. He runs to the forest to find a place to scream. He weeps loudly. He curses himself and then to the snake and then to the gods. If I have done all my duties without miss, if I have followed all the Vedic rituals as prescribed, if I have never lied, O Lord of Death, O Yam, return my beloved to me. As soon as he says these words, a strong voice fills the surroundings. Divine Messenger speaks. Ruru, my son, death is but inevitable. If it had not been for the snake, something else would have been responsible. So do not curse the snake. If it had not been for this time, it would have been some other time. So do not curse the time either. This was destined to happen. And as a learned Brahmin, you should not grieve. Ruru, however, is not satisfied. The messenger can sense it. So he continues. There is an empty dot designed by gods, but the path to obtain that is very hard. I am ready whatever it takes. Please just tell me what needs to be done replies sobbing Ruru. The Divine Messenger explains to Ruru that he can loan half of his own life to his beloved Pramadwara. Ruru agrees, and so it happens. Lord of Death, the Yam and Dharamraj, on request of the Divine Messenger, grants half of Ruru's life to Pramadwara. She now regains her life, that which belongs to Ruru. Both are married on the set day and live their lives happily. Ruru, however, does not stop here. He takes a vow that from now on he will kill every snake that he sees. He begins to carry a sharp wooden stick with himself. Many snakes die at his hands. Mahabharata is filled with many terrible vows like this. Almost every character takes a vow. They kill or get killed, driven only by the vows that they had taken. If you want to call Mahabharata war the war of vows, you will not be wrong. Had it not been for these, these vows, or if some characters had chosen to break their vows, the war would not have been that brutal. I would go to an extent to say that it wouldn't have happened in the first place. Mahabharata is an enlightening and successful story because only one person knows how to break the vows and that person was Lord Krishna. But more on that later, so let's get back to Ruru. A terrible vow has thus been taken. For the mistake of one snake, many are paying the price. 
mercilessly dying at the hands of Ruru. Until one day when Ruru encounters a special snake, one that belongs to Dundub species. These Dundub snakes are special. They look like snakes but are far lesser in terms of abilities. As for venom, they have none. Pretty much harmless snakes. As Ruru notices a Dundub, he raises his stick to cast a fatal blow but the snake speaks up. I have done no harm to you, Brahmin. Why do you want to kill me? Ruru explains how snakes have negotiated lifelong animosity with him. Dundub replies that he is but a harmless snake, although he looks like snake, but technically he is not. As a learned Brahmin, Ruru should know the difference. Ruru is in fact a learned and wise man. He reads between the lines of what Dundub has just said. As a learned Brahmin, you should know the difference. No ordinary snake-looking creature can so intelligently converse with a Brahmin. He must be a Rishi, Ruru thinks. Yes, Ruru, you got it right. I was once a Rishi, says Dundub, who has guessed what Ruru was thinking from the expression on his face. Ruru inquires the snake as to why he has assumed the form of a snake and how long does he expect to continue like this. Dundub explains to him that he was cursed by a Brahmin friend of him many years ago when, out of simple playfulness, he tried to scare him with a dummy snake. He was cursed to assume the form of a powerless snake and scare people, just as he had scared his friend with a powerless dummy snake. He was to continue to remain a snake until a Brahmin by the name of Ruru appears before him. And that day has come. Dundub transforms back into his human form that he once possessed by the name of Rishi Sahasrapat. As soon as he is relieved of his curse, he thanks Ruru. I have something to tell you, O Brahman, says the newly transformed Rishi. A Brahmin's supreme duty is to learn and retain the eternal knowledge of Vedas. It is obligatory on Brahmins to stay non-violent and peaceful, compassionate to all creatures. Holding a stick and punishing people are the natural duties of Kshatriyas, not Brahmins. Holding the stick and killing any snakes that come in your way is unfit for you as a Brahmin. When King Janmejaya once organized a snake sacrifice, which was intended to punish millions for the crimes of a few, a great Brahmin by the name of sage Astika saved many. The sage knew his duty and what religious texts expect of him mercy, truthfulness and compassion. The mention of snake sacrifice interests Ruru. He wants to know more about this, but Tundub, now sage Sahasrapat, replies that Ruru will hear this story from another Brahmin and not from him, saying that he vanishes into thin air. Ruru runs around and looks for the sage, but he is nowhere to be found. Exhausted, he gives up and returns to the ashram. He recounts this encounter with Tundhub to his father Pramati, and his father narrates to him the story of King Janmeja and his snake sacrifice. This part ends here. Here I found writer's style really unique. Until now we were assuming that Sati is good at deviating from the main story, but this time he actually brings it back to snake sacrifice. It appears so far that there are multiple stories being told, but Ultimately, all of them converged toward, converge towards a common point, just as all rivers ultimately converge to ocean. You might ask, when will the actual story begin? Well, it will, very soon. Before we conclude this episode, it's time to uh, pick up a couple of more questions from last episode. So, here we go. First question. So, this first question appears to be a follow-up from episode when we discussed fourfold objectives of dharma, artha, kam and moksha. You said dharma is our unique talent, but as we understand, it is duty, not talent. This is actually a very interesting question and in my view, the more you explore this, the more meanings you get. Dharma is sometimes meant to denote religion and at other times law. The most fascinating and easy to grasp explanation of the word dharma is given by Emmy Ganatra in her latest book titled Mahabharata Unraveled. She says, and I quote, 
Dharma is that which is needed for life to go on. Unquote. This is a very profound explanation of Dharma and the more you think about it, the more meanings you can gather. To quote an example from Ami's book, uh, Mahabharata Unraveled, At cosmic level, for human lives to exist, Earth needs to be at an appropriate distance from the Sun, spin and rotate at specific distance and at specific speed. The Sun also needs to outpour consistent heat energy. This behavior of Sun and Earth is their dharma. If they do not follow those specific principles, the whole solar system and thereby life will collapse. And another example from the same book, uh, and to quote that one as verbatim, is For a country, community, family or even a professional unit to sustain, there are certain norms, behaviors and considerations that are expected of the stakeholders. The norms and the systems have to be such that they nourish the involved entities. The overarching governing, governing principle of such units of interdependent entities that helps define the norms, behaviors, duties and codes of conduct for interaction and ensures their symbiotic existence is called Dharma. So in other words, for cosmos to exist and grow, must follow certain mathematical principles. For societies to exist and grow, they must follow certain norms. For countries to exist and grow, they must follow certain law. For individuals to exist and grow, what should they follow? They should follow their inbuilt unique talents. That is individual dharma. But hold on. For systems such as countries, societies or family units to exist, each individual must have their duties, right? Isn't that also dharma? Yes, it is dharma as well. An individual can have more than one dharma. Then what if two dharmas are competing in nature? Will it not cause confusion and chaos? It certainly will. And that is what we call dharma sankar, or a rough translation in English would be dilemma. Each individual faced with dharma sankar then makes a choice. A choice guided by his intuition and inspired by the fourth objective of moksha or self-realization. This is such a profound philosophy and is so extensively discussed throughout Mahabharata story itself that it will be difficult to give a satisfactory answer in a short episode. But as we proceed into further episodes, we shall keep discussing and expanding on this concept. Uh, next question is about episode 4. The story of uh, Ayodhya Dhyamya. The question is, why was Ayodhya Dhyamya so cruel on his student Upumanyu? Let's take a step back for a few moments. What was Upumanyu doing in the ashram? He was there for his studies. The tradition of Gurukul or ancient Indian system of education, unlike modern day education systems, required the students to step out of the comforts of their life in their parents' home and experience life as it is. This life requires you to control your temptations and sometimes focus on the task at hand. In other words, focus on the dharma. Upamanyu, for example, loved foods, uh, food and he was always tempted, but he controlled his temptation and remained firm in his dharma. This is not to say that he did not fail, he did. He gave in to his temptation and ended up eating uh, leaves from a very poisonous tree. So this tells us that if we blindly follow wherever temptations take us, we might end up uh, hurting ourselves. But then, who rescued uh, him from the situation? His Guru. Had Upamanyu read between the lines or understood the message behind his Guru's actions and words when he was adding those food restrictions, he perhaps would not have lost his eyes. This is life. It talks to you in cryptic language, one that you need to decipher. Third question, and it's going to be the last one for this episode, is that why do some stories in Mahabharata appear like magic? It just takes away the credibility of the story. Very interesting question. To answer this, let me give you another magical story which I heard from my uncle when I was a kid. 
Once upon a time, a lioness carrying her cub was on search for a food. She was not not known to the fact that there was a hunter lurking behind the trees. The hunter shoots an arrow. The lioness dies on the spot. Her young cub, perhaps a newborn, rushes to safety, but then mixes with a herd of sheep and goats. The shepherd, however, notices him and, driven by compassion, adopts him. The cub grows up with the sheep and goats. Time passes, the little frail cub turns into a mighty lion. Then one day, when the shepherd is out in jungle with his herd accompanied by the grown-up lion, tiger runs roaring towards the herd. Perhaps time for dinner. The entire herd panics, including the grown-up lion. The tiger, however, is shocked to see a lion running away from him. He thinks to himself, how come a lion and that to such a mighty one is in the company of goats and sheep? The tiger calls on the lion and drags him to a nearby well. He makes him see his face in the water. And he asks him, what are you doing with these miserable goats? The lion responds, these are my friends and mates. I grew up with them. The tiger literally giggles. Your friends? He steps back and roars as loud as he can. Sheep scream and run around wildly, hoping not to be eaten. He then asks the lion to roar like him with his full energy. The lion roars. The frightening sound waves of his roar hit the eardrums of the last few goats as they were running away. They freeze in fear as if they already know their fate. So the story ends here. Did it appear magical? Like lions talking, tiger dragging a lion and making him roar, all that stuff. I personally haven't seen this type of encounter between a lion and tiger or a lion hanging out with goats and sheep, so definitely it's a magical fictional story. It is not magic of the story, but it's morale that matters. What Tiger meant was that the lion should recognize who he is, what his potential is, and what his dharma is, and then perhaps stop hanging out with goats and sheep. Will that lion turn violent now and eat his childhood mates? This is the choice that he will have to make, guided by his intuition and inspired by what he thinks is his path to moksha or self-realization. I hope I have answered your questions in sufficient detail. With that, uh, we will end this episode here. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and if so, please do not forget to like, subscribe and share. And yes, do send me your questions and feedback. In next episode, we will cover 5th sub parva in the Adi Parva called Astika Parva. Until then, goodbye and take care.